This is a Borns 500K audio taper pot. Let's open it up and take a look inside. First step is to remove or lift up these four tabs. I'm going to use this um, sharp straight edge screwdriver just to wedge underneath those tabs and lift them up. They're pretty tight when you first get started. You may need to use something even sharper like maybe the sharp edges of some cutters. Just be careful not to cut them off. All right, with those lifted up, the entire body of the pot just pulls away. Now the shaft connects through the uh, phenolic wafer to a plastic disc on the back. The plastic disc um, has been crimped onto the shaft, and there's no easy way to get that off without uh, damaging it, make it impossible to put it back together. So I'm leaving it on there. Um, you can see that the plastic disc underneath it has this wiper which has a dimple in it and the dimple is touching down onto the phenolic wafer in one place. Now printed onto the phenolic wafer is a ring of conductive carbon material. I can't really see it under this but it's printed connecting from, it comes out from this lug, see that little black strip right there, it comes out and it's printed in a big circle around like this and then connects up on this end like this. Um, that amount of conductive material is what determines the resistance of this pot. In fact, if you just take your multimeter and connect it across these two lugs, uh, it doesn't matter where the shaft is, that tells you what the overall resistance of the pot is. And it's based on the amount of carbon material printed there. Let's take a quick look at another brand of pot because it's easier to see inside than the Borns. This is a CTS brand pot and it's put together pretty differently from the Borns we were just looking at. Now I've already lifted up the four tabs so that we can easily pull this off and you can see that this threaded shaft is uh, pulls off completely separately from the rest of the body of the pot, allowing this wafer just to come off totally separately. And that's pretty different from the Borns in which the, um, the, the wafer was integral to the shaft and the plastic disc. You couldn't pull them apart without damaging the pot. Now in this one, you can see the both the outer and the inner wiper and the outer and inner rings here. Um, and we just couldn't see on the borns. This inner ring here is raised up a little bit and it's connected directly to the center lug and you can see the inner wiper here rides on that ring while the outer wiper rides along the uh, conductive ring. And this wiper is actually got two raised lips which push up against the uh, the conductive material on the ring, they push with a fair amount of force and that combined with this grease that it's riding on here um, make this pot a fair bit more difficult to turn although it uh, it feels pretty good. Uh, unlike the Borns which is really really easy and light light to turn, this one once it's all sort of pushed down and compressed together it takes a fair amount of force to turn but it feels nice and stable. And I think you can see from the, the construction and the way I just put that back together, this is a really well-built pot. So now the way the pot works, when you turn the shaft, as I mentioned, that little dimple in the, in the wiper is touching that ring of material in only one place. What you're doing is making a connection between this lug right here through that carbon material that's printed on the, on the, uh, the wafer to the dimple in the wiper which then connects to the center ring and out through the lug. So the amount of resistance is determined by where the dimple is touching the outer ring. For example, if I point the dimple right here, so that the dimple is very close to this lug, uh, the distance between this lug and this lug is extremely short, almost no resistance. What it's doing is coming in here, touching the dimple, going to the center ring and going straight back out. But if we turn the shaft so that now the dimple is pointing up here, it has farther to travel from the beginning of this lug. It has to go through this all this conductive material printed on the wafer all the way up to the dimple. Then it can travel out through the center ring and out this lug. So in other words, there's more stuff to go through, more resistance. Now, so what's this lug over here, you ask? Simply the opposite. Uh, the distance between this lug and the center is from here up to the dimple and out and on this side it's from here all the way around to here and out. So in other words if uh, if we've got the if this is a 500k pot and 
the total resistance between here and here is 500k. If I position the dimple right here, well, the distance from here to here is real small, maybe, let's say, 100k. Uh, so you'd have a 100k resistance between these two lugs. But the distance from here to here is all the way around the, the, the longer side to the dimple and out. So that's probably about 400k. See, they add up to 500. Now, the way that the conductive material is printed onto the wafer determines what's called the pot's taper. A linear taper is one in which the material has been printed on uh, in an even fashion all the way around the ring. Uh, same thickness, same width, uh, and the same material from the beginning to the end. Uh, and this produces an even progression of resistance as you move the wiper around. For example, if this is a 100K pot uh, and you put the wiper at 25%, you'll get 25K, at 50% you'll get 50K, and at 75% you'll get 75K, all the way up 100. That's called a linear taper. Now, for a logarithmic or audio taper, the resistance changes in an exponential uh, progression as you move the wiper around, meaning the resistance changes faster as you move up. Now, you could imagine that the material is printed onto the wafer with an actual physical taper that's narrower at the bottom and wider and wider and wider as it uh, moves towards the top, uh, thus giving you less resistive material at the bottom to travel through and therefore less resistance. But as you move up, more and more resistive material means that it's changing uh, to higher and higher resistance in, in a non-linear way. And while really expensive pots may implement such a physical taper, cheaper ones don't. It's just too expensive to manufacture. Instead, they approximate it by implementing several linear tapers of different slopes. I'm not sure how many uh, segments there really are in these pots. It's probably two or three, depending on the manufacturer. Now, there's different ways they could implement these multiple stages of linear taper. They could use different conductive materials that have different resistance and lay them down the ring in a sequence, or they could uh, use different thicknesses of the same material. So they start out with a thinner section and then a slightly thicker section, etc., to increase resistance. So the end result is an approximation of a logarithmic taper. And as we've seen with these different manufacturing methods, maybe different numbers of linear segments or different materials used, uh, not all pot tapers are created equal. If you are finding that your pot's taper is not what you expect, then try a different pot. To determine whether your pot is linear or log, first check for markings on the pot. If there's a part number, uh, a B in the part number typically indicates a linear taper, whereas an A would be an audio or logarithmic taper. Now, if there's no markings, like on this pot, there's still an easy way to find out. Just uh, like we did before, measure the total resistance of the pot over the outer lugs. This one's 182K. And then measure from the side to the center and try to put the pot um, right in the middle. And if you get a number that's about 50% of the total resistance, uh, that would be a linear pot. This one's coming out in the 90s, which is half of 180, so this is linear. Now for a logarithmic pot like this one, uh, again, first check for the part number. This one actually says right on it uh, A500K, so uh, I know it's logarithmic, but if I didn't know that, uh, I would measure the outer lugs again. I see it's 522K, and then measure from the side to the center and try to put it in the middle. And this one, as you can see, is uh, nowhere near 250K, so it's obviously not linear. So those are the basics of how potentiometers work. In my other videos, I'll be covering guitar applications of pots, like volume and tone pots, how to modify a tone pot to be no load or true bypass, and how to select replacement pots and wire them up. So check those out if you're interested, and thanks for watching.